Hi, this is Paul Gregg, and I'm going to make a video that documents some of my 2017 work. It's three years after that, the fact, and uh, this is a little intimidating for me because if, yeah, I did a lot of work here, and I don't want to talk about all of it. A lot of it was dead ends, a lot of it was interesting, a lot of it... Uh, uh, it was just a, a lot of stuff, uh, but I do want to document uh, what I did in some fashion. Mainly, there are people who are trying to carry on the PVC backyard roller coaster uh, work, and I wanted to uh, bring them a, a little bit up to speed to where I ended my work. Uh, at the time, in 2017, I was working with some MIT students who wanted to build a, a, a roller coaster for their rush week. They had built plywood roller coasters previously, and uh, they were they contacted me because I had success in uh, PVC uh, backyard roller coasters. Uh, they were, of course, going to um, have heavier passengers than my grandchildren, uh, which I've tried to restrict uh, my roller coasters to. And generally, if somebody wants to ride adults on a backyard roller coaster, I think it can be done with Schedule 80 PVC and wood, but I think it's a lot smarter to do it with welded steel uh, track and uh, wood framed <coughs> backyard roller coaster. Um, and I maintain that. Um, you got to get things really right if you're going to ride adults on a PVC roller coaster. I think it's possible. I think a lot of people, most people would have difficulty getting the accuracy and uh, and doing it. So, um, what I want to concentrate on, the weak spot of the PVC backyard roller coaster is where the rails, the formed PVC pipes, uh, connect to the wood 2x4 cross ties. And... Uh, Engineers always attack the weak spot, uh, and then once you improve that, then you find you've got another weak spot, and you uh, attack that, and and eventually you get a very good design. So this is the what I perceive to be the weak spot, and uh, I did a lot of uh, con. I kind of like what an engineer does is open it up wide open, give me any concept, give me thirty or fifty concepts, and then I'll I'll. Uh, do down selecting uh, by trade studies, either by analysis or fabrication and test, or whatever means. Um, so to kind of set the ground rule here, I uh, will open this presentation. This is uh, this is like I said I was working with. It's a phase two testing. Um, I had a lot of testing before this. I won't go into. Um, but there's a lot of different variables we could uh, look at as to far as to as far as how to design an attachment between the rail and the tie. Uh, you could analyze them with finite elements. They have to be nonlinear finite elements. It'd be very complicated, and uh, it's probably cheaper and easier to just uh, build some and test them. And that's what I did. Um, it's not only stiff strength that counts, but it's also stiffness. You wouldn't want a, a joint that just drooped every time a cart went by. So uh, my grandfather, who was an eighth grade education and worked a farm in Wyoming, he would say it not only had to be strong, it had to be stout. And what he meant was it had to be stiff as well. So... Um, Ballpark numbers, uh, MIT students, the maximum would be 260 pounds. They wanted to actually go up to 4.5 Gs, which is a lot. Uh, that's, that, that's the equivalent of the, the highest G roller coaster in the world, one in South Africa. Uh, but you wouldn't be doing 4.5 Gs for very long, and that's a whole other discussion about uh, duration of uh, the Gs. So 260-pound limit load times a one-and-a-half factor of safety because we have a lot of errors we want to cover up and unknowns. 
Uh, that's, so that's 390 pound ultimate. You times that by four and a half G's and we're talking about a 1,755 pound ultimate equivalent static load on an eight wheel cart. We assume 60% of the weight is on the aft wheels, the aft four wheels, the aft bogey. And so that's uh, 1,054 pounds on the, on the four wheels of the aft bogey. Um, we assume a, an imperfect bank ankle adds another 25%. You know, if it was leaning left or right, add 25% for that. This is all ballpark stuff, but we want to get in, in the ballpark. So uh, that divided by one times 1.25 divided by four wheels per bogey, and we get 326. 329 pounds per wheel. Uh, we'd feel pretty good if we had a joint that could withstand that. And there's two wheels on every wheel set. Uh, so to be successful, I'm saying we need about twice that, two times 329, 658 pounds of test load, because I'm going to test with two wheels. Um, even with the air gaps, even with uh, all variables, and uh, we think that's, uh, I thought that was a pretty good target if we could do that. <coughs> Prior testing, uh, minimum with the wheels directly over the fasteners was 869 without gaps, and so we know the gaps are going to decrease that a little bit. I do have a gapless uh, design that I will show you at the very end of this. I, I, Apologize. This is gonna might take. It could take a lot longer if I go into the details of every every one. But I'm kind of going to gloss over the concepts, gloss over the the results, say kind of which ones ended up looking better, and then and then that's it. I'm, it's not an exhaustive finished study. It's a it's a work in progress. Um, uh, the wheels on a given truck are only five inches apart. Okay. We also test with a four-wheel bogey loading center. Okay, even with extensive element level testing, a total load of at least 1755 would be uh, really what you'd want to target. So, uh, let me just go through these concepts. This is uh, I started off with just two deck screws in a in the end with a cupped end on a. Uh, if you've been following me, you know my general design in that respect. Uh, just adding another fastener would be one way to increase the, the load carrying capability of the um, rail tie uh, joint. Uh, I thought maybe uh, putting uh, larger fasteners, drill some holes in the outside and just put them in directly would be certainly stiffer and see how that does. I don't think that did very well though actually because the failure mode really is the wood next to the fastener splitting in a, what we call a mode one composite failure. And uh, so that one didn't work out very well. Uh, since we're trying to reinforce the wood, uh, somebody where I used to work, Brian Casperson, said, why don't you just coat the end with fiberglass and that'll, that'll protect, you know, that'll strengthen the wood really where the fasteners go in. And, and that turned out pretty good. I tested a couple of those, but although it was a mess to put the fiberglass on the end of that thing you'd have to uh, get that down. Uh, what if we just put a reinforcing plate on the bottom of it uh, to help the wood carry that fastener load? Uh, another guy named Maxicus Martin gave me a couple ideas. He said, why don't you just do this kind of a thing? I put a U-bolt and a steel strap. It, You know, these things are going to get complicated and obviously more expensive than than what I was doing, but uh, if they had that capability and you could ride heavier uh, people with more G's, then maybe it's worth it. Um, came up with a variation of that, just put a slot in the wood and, and put a U-bolt through and put fasteners in it. I thought this might, you know, you could, I'm trying, with, with engineering, you always try to find the simple idea that would work, that wouldn't cost too much. And, and I thought about putting holes in the in the pipe, which is kind of a bad idea because you mess up the the whole load path in the pipe. It has to go around a hole, um, but it's possible that this might work. Uh, I don't think I built and tested that though. Uh, somebody might want to. Uh, here's a variation on the U-bolt that might be a little easier. Um, another variation, barrel nuts uh, in a hole. A bar in a hole, barrel nuts in a hole, 
and then a, a fabric tape wrap. I, I did this with uh, fiberglass tape. Didn't work very well. Uh, so then I started thinking about cables. Uh, could we run cables across the top of the tie through some from uh, sloped holes? Put a little plate on the end and put fasteners on the end of that. Uh, could you put nylon or polyester or some kind of straps? I know in, I was in Hong Kong. They use bamboo, bamboo scaffolding and they have just high strength nylon that they just twist tie the thing on. It's amazing how they build the scaffolding in Hong Kong. If you want to look that up. I tried a couple of these and, and they kind of, they weren't very stiff. And maybe you could solve that problem. But, uh, here's, uh, an end steel. You'd have a steel plate on the end, fabricate that somehow. And, uh, and then it would reinforce the wood. Extruded hard plastic uh, end fitting. I machined one of these. Uh, Ken Grice at Boeing, where I used to work, uh, came up with this idea. I thought it was uh, had merit because uh, you could make once you extruded this, you could make it fairly inexpensively and just uh, have a whole mess of those that would help out the wood. You're really trying to save the wood here. That's the the weak spot. Um, I tried to, this would be vertical plywood where you'd have the grain and I, I built one of these and tested it. It didn't turn out all that much better. Um, these are some side plates, uh, made out of some kind of plastic. Uh, I made a couple of those and tested them and it did a little better. Five fasteners, you know. Uh, this is an interesting concept, kind of like the cables. Uh, you've, uh, everybody knows about steel strapping and you could, uh, Cut some slots in the in the pipe, uh, s thread some straps through, and then uh, tighten them down with just like they do on a shipping box. Um, I didn't try that, but it's an idea. These are more expensive ideas where you just say, "Look, if I had all the money in the world, what would I do, and how would I do this?" And uh, you could make aluminum or steel fittings that uh, that interface between the rail and the tie. But I didn't build any of those. But, you know, you want to say, okay, what if I had all the money in the world? What if I didn't have any money? What's the cheapest one? What's the most expensive one? What uh, You want to kind of open a trade study up to all the ideas. This is uh, kind of like, like I said, if I was going to, if I had high G's and adults riding, I would just go with welded steel. And uh, people have done this. I found a, an off-road place in Oregon uh, that uh, you just get a fairly inexpensive Harbor Freight pipe threader and a uh, pipe bender, and you can make a roll bender. So you just put the pipe in and roll it back and forth with this motorized uh, mechanism. And uh, you tighten it down a little bit every time, and you come up. That's how you roll the steel uh, to make a, a nice radius. And people have done that. They've... Uh, that I suggested that too. Um, you got to know how to weld, but this is this is the ones I've the the small backyard roller coasters I've seen that, uh, on YouTube. They seem to say they spend around ten thousand dollars to make the track, so it is significantly more expensive than a PVC track. And uh, I came, I thought about welded steel brackets, some kind of brackets that would. Uh, save the wood there and uh, transfer the load better. Uh, you would, if you wanted to drill these, you'd have to be drilling through steel, the PVC and then the steel, and that seems to be feasible. You know, you could do that, but it's not going to be easy to do, especially out in your yard. <clears throat> Bent no, metal brackets with no welds. Um, I think I made some things similar to this, and, and and they all do really a lot better than my baseline. So there's lots of options here. Um, another steel bracket concept. So uh, I made up uh, some kind of a system for uh, keeping track of all of these specimens I was building and testing. Uh, this is the little fixture I used. Uh, it's just really the end of a you just take the end of a, a tie with a curved radius on or whatever kind of end it had. And uh, and there's my, my test thing. I put this in a little test frame that I made and 
And in a previous video, I showed you how that I calibrated my testing mechanism. It was pretty crude, but but for comparison purposes, I think it worked pretty well. Um, we did. Have, I did have some concepts that got <clears throat> so strong that I was uh, failing the wheels. These are the hardest uh, uh, roller skate roller skate wheels I could find, harder than any skateboard wheels. So um, once you get to the point where you're seeing a different failure happen, then you got to start working on the other failure mode, and that's that's probably what I did with some of these concepts. <coughs> so there's the the test method. A successful, uh, quote, successful test load would be 820, 800, 628 pounds. So here's my frame that I made. Uh, it's a bottle jack with a PVC pipe with graduation little, little lines on it. And then I just pulled down on this fish scale. And I, I calibrated this at the University of Washington Structural Test Lab. So I was pretty sure that I was uh, getting the, the right test results. And there's a test going on right there. So I'm just trying to push off the uh, the little piece of pipe from the end of a tie. And this is a typical test. You can see the wood splits at the fasteners first. That's generally what happens if you don't reinforce the wood in any way. And uh, this was one with a third fastener, 1146 pounds, which is way better than uh, the one which is two fasteners. Um, so that's good. This is the test matrix, uh, and this is what I'm not going to go into too much detail. Basically, my early ones with the internal screws didn't hold 628 pounds. Everything else did, and some of them went up to almost 2,000 pounds, um, some of the tests. there is. I did check the stiffness, which just is a matter of, you know, stiffness is the load divided by the deflection. And that gives you an idea how stiff, stiff it is. And some of them were really stiff, of course. Uh, and my baseline is this one. Well, one of these. Um, uh, you have to decide what's failure. You know, when did this really fail? You know, it failed a lot earlier than what you see here. And so as soon as you heard a noise and saw that something was cracking, I call that failure. Even though it could take higher load than that later, uh, you can see generally what I call a first failure uh, is where the wood starts to crack. You hear a little noise, you back it off and look, and yeah, the, the wood around the fast where the fastener enters is, is starting to split open in a mode one. Mode one is, well, I'll look that up. It's where the wood splits on the end. <clears throat> And then generally they take a lot more load than that to, to actually before I quit testing. But that's really not of interest. It's of interest in that uh, if you were, if a roller coaster was going along and, and something, you heard some pops and, and you say, oh, I think something broke, the roller coaster would still go on and you could probably use it even again. And, uh, and it wouldn't have really resulted in some kind of catastrophic failure or injury to anybody. But... I'm call, so I'm conservatively calling, you know, when I first hear a noise and I, and I find something even a little bit wrong, I'm calling that, or a little bit permanently bent or something like that, I'm calling that the, uh, the failure, even though they generally take a lot more load than that. So, uh, you look through these. I, this is what I'm not going to go through in detail because I could spend hours and hours talking about each one of these. Um, in general, uh, yeah, they all did well. Some of them with the steel ends uh, did really well. Uh, there's the bar and the hole concept. There's the internal fastener concept that didn't do very well. Uh, and the rest of them did uh, probably 30% better than my baseline, sometimes twice as good as the baseline, especially the ones with the, the, the sack. The, the, the fiberglass on the ends did help the wood not split, and you can see the split in the fiberglass there. Um, um, yeah, it worked fine. Uh, the specimens failed at much higher than the, the, my baseline. Uh, I don't know how much trouble this would be in actual practice to do this. You can see these wheels, you wouldn't call this, the, you wouldn't say that the wheels hadn't failed at this point, even though they'll spring back and look like new. You'd, you'd, uh, the wheels are failing here as well as at the same time the joint is. Um, the trouble with 
having wheels like this, if you got to a certain load, you'd, you'd uh, create so much friction by having the wheel turning and with that much load on it, the wheels would heat up and, and, uh, and distort. And that's actually what happened. The students at uh, MIT, they built a PVC track in the basement of a building. They put a thousand pounds on four wheels. They rolled it back and forth a thousand times and their wheels failed. They had picked some somebody's skateboard wheels and uh, they're probably fairly soft and they were distorting a lot even you know as they rolled this thing back and forth. And the wheels failed before the joint failed, which is a good thing, good, good news for the joint, but... Uh, bad news for the wheels. Uh, I think they could have built a PVC uh, back at roller coaster to just use for a few days and then tear down in the end. But uh, they didn't. Uh, they went to with a plywood roller coaster that they had done before. And I understand that, you know, it's all about risk. And um, They had a uh, one of the professors had concerns about the fracture toughness of PVC if it did actually fail. Um, and as, but I always say, if you if you make sure that the wheels can't can't whack a fastener, then the PVCs around the fastener is not going to fail, unless you drop a rock on the track or something like that, which you know is, you wouldn't be riding it if you cracked it that way anyway. Um, they had some concerns about that, and uh, they went with a. Uh, what they knew, which is what a lot of engineering people do. You know, in the end, it's hard to make changes when you have something that works, even if it's expensive or even if it doesn't work as well as, as another concept. So change is, change is hard. Um, this is a metal bracket, and they did hold a lot of uh, load. Uh, once the wood was taken out of the failure, out of the load path, then uh, this one held... 2,190 pounds, so, you know, probably almost three times as much as uh, my baseline. And uh, so the steel ones, the steel bracket concepts did really well. Schedule 80 always does better than Schedule 40 because uh, it's just thicker. Um, I'm getting into too much detail here. This is uh, another steel concept that held a lot of, you can see the wheels are way beyond what you'd call a failure. Uh, this is a little concept, can kind of grab the wood, the 1,800 pounds, very good. Uh, so here's my observations. I'm not going to go into detail about this. I'll just get uh, wrapped around the axle. This was three years ago. I just mainly wanted to put out the concepts, and, and uh, you can see what you think about them. Most of the concepts exceeded, uh, more than exceeded the, my baseline load, some by a factor of two. The bar and hole concepts did okay. The fiberglass concepts did okay. Uh, anything with steel in it did much better. Oh, Schedule 80, of course, is better than uh, Schedule 40 by 20% stiffer, 20% stronger usually. So, text fixture worked really well. There's a cross section of what I would say, you know, to put this together, you need uh, some kind of good fixturing to make sure the rails, the rail, the gauge stays constant. Now these are some, I just did this work. I thought uh, there must be a way of adapting a complex path track to uh, the ties. And this was a couple of concepts I came up with. You'd have some pre-made parts, plastic parts probably um, start out uh, 3D print them, and then uh, if you got up to quantity, if you were selling these or you wanted to make a lot in quantity, you could uh, in injection mold these or compression mold them uh, much for very high quantities. And this is the one I, this is a concept I finally ended up with that I think you could adapt any, to some, to some reasonable extent, you could adapt how the track angle comes in and and you'd have these uh, two different uh, parts here that would adapt any configuration uh, to a from the rail to the tie, and it would also not uh, put the, the wood wouldn't be in play very much because you'd have this angle piece. So I guess three distinct parts here, and you could put that together. 
and I'd be interested if anybody ever tries this to see if that works out pretty well. So that uh, was uh, my study in 2017 working with the MIT students. Thanks for watching.